come in or do you have to wait till the uh, replay? What did they say that was? Oh, yes. Live from New York, it's... Yeah. <laughs> okay. You ready? Here we yep. go. <clears throat> Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. This is Karen Newman, and this is the Saturday Human Colony Hukudlo webinar. It is Saturday, the 9th of June, 2008, and we have a very special guest that I'll introduce in just one moment. Um, but if you are interested in joining the Human Colony webinars, we're doing something a little special today due to technical difficulties. We're doing this in Zoom, but normally we do it live on Google Plus and it streams live on YouTube, but the people watching on YouTube will be able to watch it in the replay. Uh, we hope that uh, you'll find our links and be able to come into the, to the Zoom room. But uh, our website is, human, excuse me, it's hukolo.org. I'm a little flustered. And <laughs> Dr. Ram's laughing at me. And if uh, we have a workshop coming up on the uh, 16th of August, it's the 16th through the 21st. It's the Human Colony Workshop. It's, it'll take place in New York, and it's $400 for five days. We'll be teaching galactic Reiki, uh, channeling, and you will have classes with Max and Jim. So go to hukolo.org, and you'll find out all the information. So just to tell you who's in the room, we have David, we have... Michelle, we have Selesh, we have Don, myself, and our special guest, Dr. Ram, Dr. Richard Allen, Allen Miller. He is a physicist, a Harvard professor, a knowing of everything person. <laughs> his, his studies are fi far and wide. He has written over 50 books, am I correct? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. Go from there. You misspelled my middle name. I'm so sorry. No, no, just making it safe so that okay. everybody gets to the right. I'll website. change it on the. Uh, I'll change it on the uh, communication. Yeah. I'll go back and read it. L a a n l l a. And Ian is here too. Okay. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's called pig lipping. Yes, That's I saw comment. it. Neurolinguistic programming where I watch your eyes glaze over and then I slip in a command. You never Is that what it was? Yeah. Okay. That's how it works. Pig All lipping. right. Perfect. Okay. Hey, why don't you give us a little bit of a background for the people who, I mean, I know that you're very well known, but there's a lot of people, especially the younger people sure. that may not be familiar with your work. So why don't you tell I'm, us uh, who you are and yeah. what you're about? I'm blessed uh, with an eidetic memory. That means I'm basically four years old and I never became seven. My memory is eidetic. I work a little more efficient than photographic memory. The military used me uh, in the early 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, when I came out of graduate school. My first degrees are in physics. Then I did Harvard Medical, and I'm an anesthesiologist. And now I'm a Jungian psychotherapist. I'd studied under Kubler-Ross and James Hillman. I am um, about as tough as you can get in terms of mathematics and physics. That's what I am. I'm a physicist. So uh, with that said, I started the SEAL program for the Navy. I was SEAL team number one, team leader, and uh, actually trained SEAL teams two and three. Uh, from there, I moved to the Pentagon and was basically lead physicist at the Pentagon under the Richard Nixon era. I um, actually got to go into the Oval Office as a young kid and uh, tell the president what we knew, what we didn't know, and what I was concerned about. Uh, at that time, just so you have a snapshot, we knew about aliens back then, but we were way more concerned with what the Russians were doing. Prague and Czechoslovakia was way ahead of the world in psychic discoveries. That's Ostrander and Schroeder. Um, they have a second book called Psychic Discoveries Inside the United States, and there will be a number of pages on the work I did for the military. That's what I did when they encountered something paranormal, they would bring in A-Team, and predicated on which coast it was, it was either Dr. Carl Schleicher, also known as the Smoking Man, it was Bill Franklin, Wilbur Franklin, if it was in the Kent State uh, in the Midwest, or it was me at the University of Washington. And I worked out of anesthesiology. I was uh, Jerry Pollack, who wrote uh, The Fourth Phase of Water, was my lead in 1970. 
So that's where I came from. Um, my education is as tight as you can get it because I'm a spiritual entity. I uh, uh, was initiated to Sharon Singh. I'm a satsangi. I meditate and train the mind. I've been doing that since the early 70s. Um, I know that I don't know. Uh, trying to just get along, you know, in a world that has been obviously invaded by something. And when the minister said, is the house white or brown? The correct answer is yes. Because we are limited. We cannot see the bigger picture, uh, which is what I aspire toward, the, the broader view. That's why I'm circular rather than linear, going straight in. Um, and you will find that all of the way I approach things gives you a better sense of your first question on giving you an ed edge on who I am. I'm very good at what I do, and I know that I don't know. So where does that put us? Well, knowledge, information, is not what you think it is. It is illusion, uh, because what I have discovered, or the model that I'm going to choose to work with, is that imagination is reality. And that means that that is what shapes our current view of what we would call reality. There are tribes, uh, Aborigines, that have historical references going back like enemy mind medicine on, on their history. And you know, you have the Inuit, which are several thousand years older than the Hopi. And then you have the Aborigines, who by the way today are starting a conference in Brisbane on the secret history of Australia. That's very interesting. That's part of the Nexus conference groups and Nexus magazine with which I write. I try to stay current. Uh, it's impossible today with information overload. Um, knowing that information is not real, how does that discern the constructs of disinformation? And uh, what I'm gonna try to do is be as transparent as I can so that you can see through my intellect and get to the essence of what we're trying to talk about. And uh, knowing that I don't know, physics and religion are basically your right and left brain. It's a cavitation process like an hourglass and that what you actually really have is neither. What you have is the moment in between. That uh, time is a duration of consciousness. That's Robert Ornstein, others even all the way back into philosophy. So time is illusion. One of the things I trained SEALs on was how to change their perception of time with just breath control. And by doing that, it took our martial arts to a paranormal level because of the precision that we would have in guiding the movement. Now, when you can change time, and I just did that, and I don't know if you could have seen a sense. There it is. That's where it's at, that moment. And if you get to that place, that becomes sacred over the profane. And that's what we're seeking now, is going back into the sacred. So these Aborigine tribes would say that there are certain dream states that have more content to reality than consciousness does. When I watch a woman rip a car door off to save her daughter in a flaming automobile, and I've seen that happen. I've literally been there when it happened. How is that possible when the bone in her body isn't nearly as strong as steel? From a physics point of view, it's impossible unless that person is going into an altered state of consciousness that allows her access to a different set of laws. And that is the premise on which I will base most of my understanding of things. And the reason the military used me was that I was always 20 to 30 years ahead of physics and technology. And when I came to a fork in the road, I instinctively knew which way to turn in terms of what will later become consensus reality. Models in physics come and go every 20 years. Right now, 
I am the author of the original concept of a holographic concept of reality. How did that happen? I worked for all, when I graduated from high school and then later from undergraduate school at Pullman in physics, old man DuPont was there waiting for me with a job offer. And I turned him down in my high school and I went to Pullman. I then accepted his job and he took me back to the East Coast. And here I am walking down a hall the experimental research laboratories. When I look in this one door, and here is a three-dimensional color TV in actual production. There, it works. And I walked into the lab saying, "Wow, how does this work?" You know. And that's when I met old man Gabor, that had gotten a Nobel Prize on taking two dimensions of film and creating a three-dimensional image called a hologram. And I immediately saw that. What is happening here is a difference in quantum mechanics, which is basically taking an analog system and digitizing it. And with that comes Heisenberg with his idea that the more you know about one thing, the less you know about something else. That's the uncertainty principle. And once you have that concept of going from an analog to a digital system, you know, working it in steps like the size of an atom the size of a proton, et cetera. Now you have the idea of uncertainty of where the electron might be in reference to all of that. And so that became what was called the many body problem in modern physics before they called it quantum mechanics. It was called modern physics and uh, when I took it. And basically uh, we had the many body problem with describing the equation of motion for an electron around a single proton. It was impossible by definition. And so what happens next, that's because there's a distinction between a wave and a particle. Again, going from analog to digital. And so what was needed was a new model for viewing everything. And I suggested that a hologram was n dimensions of information compact in n minus one dimensions. And that mathematics would be what you call Mendelbrot, Julia, or May patterns in, in what we call fractal physics. It's not fuzzy logic. That's earlier in the way your, your, your washer and dryer work, they use fuzzy logic. Uh, now, with that said, you're getting a big picture because when you set up a model for a universe, you start with, assumed truths like, oh, I don't know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That's no longer true, is it? That means that the then definitions of what information might be change. And so today, realizing that we have curved space and time is a function of gravity, et cetera, and that there is no such thing as gravity, the Earth sucks. Uh, there, that's a good model. Let's work with that one. <laughs> what happens is that when you set these things up, you set up a series of doors that are possible, and then a bunch of doors that are no longer possible. And that's the concept of irrationality. And so in irrational numbers, uh, like the square root of minus one. It's a simple process. And what you have to do is realize the limitations. And today we're using information which will in 20 years no longer be valid. I'm already starting to see something even more because I did that 45 years ago before Carl Prebram or John Bohm. And the reason I'm not in Talbot's book, The Holographic Universe, is that the time he wrote that book, all of my work was classified top secret. Anything I did. In fact, I even did uh, a, a paper called Embryonic Holography, and the military came into my bookstore as I'm working Navy intelligence. I'm a, you know, I was a GS-18, that's a two-star general equivalent. They arrested me, went through my files, and took my files on embryonic holography. The current paper that is available is from Remembering, what I had originally wrote. It's not the same paper that I wrote. 
Isn't that interesting? There's your timeline concept with mandala, which we'll get into. Why don't it's we different. talk about that a little bit, the mandala effect, with, because for people, that's a big, that's something that they can really understand because they've experienced it. Some people have experienced it uh, individually, what, and some people have experienced it collectively. Memory, like, oh, die, forgot. And no, it was green, not red. Well, yeah. I've, I've had I've had a, I've had a personal experience with that where I, I we all have, yeah. you know, where a house that was on my street was different from one day to the next, literally different. It had a different uh, outside than it had the day before. Going back in time is recreating the hologram at that moment of the way the brain was as a four dimensional hologram of five space. The brain, this brain, is mostly there to make all your beliefs true. Right. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't have believed it. Right. Okay, well, and if you get the hologram wrong, what do you have? Behind the green door, another pornography thing. How's that sound? Well, <laughs> it's all about memory and what it is and what it is not. Isn't it interesting? that you have two brains just like Nibiru and our galaxy's black hole. Explain. Isn't that interesting? Well, explain what do you mean, how do well, we have two brains? Let's start with what a cavitation process is. Okay. And cavitation is a very interesting concept in phenomena. It's like you have a barrier between the above ground and below ground, like your plant and your mycorrhizae. Ah, oh, metaphor. So what's happening is that a drop of water falls and hits a pool of water. And when it does, it goes poip and bounces back up as a ball of water. However, it is no longer a ball of water. What it is, is a bubble of exclusion zone water that has trapped the medium in which it's falling. Poip, because how that bubble is formed is the waves going inward and slapping and forming a ball, capturing the media in which it's falling in, in this case air. If you take a closer look inside, you will find that that is what Roger Penrose called Taurus Twister Space. And it's a uh, into the out of. <laughs> On a so is the Mandela up. effect the, the, the drop of water coming into the water or is it the it water is, itself it is, uh, being like penetrated. You see, when the when the ball when the drop of water hits, yeah. you have a bunch of waves going out. That's your right. future. Okay. The waves that go in and they slap and form a ball, capturing boip, a reflection of reality. That is what is called a cavitation ball. You will see it in nature in the leading edge of a wave, moving faster than the wave itself. And you can draw a little thing in here and I'll send you that as an upload, showing you the quantum mechanical relationships of cold fusion. And that work is being done by Mark LeClaire at MIT right now, in the movement of a wave, moving faster than the ocean itself. We have it in many different forms, we just haven't noticed it before, what we call cold fusion processes. But it's uh, where, Curvon suggested that potassium is converted into sodium in the body as a cold fusion process. And I have a paper at Cornell right now through Seventh Review. It's called the adenosine triphosphate, ATP, as, as the process of cold fusion in the body. And I can show you how you can change your metaphysics or metaphors or your meta beyond to the next level using yeah. the concepts in your mind's eye. And that's why my latest new manuscript in draft, ready for press, the brief that I sent to you was three of 10 parts of just chapter seven. Okay. And that was called the illusion of reality. This isn't real. In fact, at the very moment of death, you have one, this is Zen Gardner. I love Zen Gardner. I realize he's out because of his original connections with cults. However, 
I find his writings better than mine. <laughs> and I'm impressed with his insight. And so I like to quote sometimes from him when he said, the last grand illusion is at the moment of death when you're offered a choice. And you either can do what Kubler-Ross talks about and even Alexander and the proof of death, proof of heaven, is that you have a tunnel of light with all your friends waving. Come on back in, the water's fine. Come on, we're waiting for you. We, we wanna take you in. And your dog that you lost went to heaven waiting for you. Yeah, that's the birth canal. Mm. Yeah. And what the Buddhists talk about out of the Bordeaux Sadal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the other choice is the blue light getting off the wheel. Now, this is all in metaphor. That is where your mandala timelines, plural, occur. And at the moment of death, the very moment of death, there is in every single human being and animal a five gram weight loss. Right. And that is structured water inside a microtubule. And if you look at the exclusion zone that's formed by water when it touches something, it's one million times, that's six zeros, more efficient than gallium and arsenic touch forming the forbidden zone where you do your checksum error figures and your storage retrieval in com modern computers. It's one million times more efficient. What does that say? Well, that means it has all your past, future, and present lives all stored in one little point. And where does that go? Well, usually it goes back home to the multiverse or what is now being proposed as the multiverse. But what's really happening is that you're being able to step outside of time and space. What's this meeting? Has been I have it. I have it. Got it. I've okay. clicked it. No worries. I see. I just went off. I started noticing. Well, that can I, I, I want to interrupt you for just a moment because I, because it, this is really good and, and I want to kind of unpack sure. a little bit of what you said because yeah. you talked. The first thing you talked about was the the woman pulling the the car door off and then she entered some sort of altered state in order to to not. Trans well, actually, to transgress this earthly laws, which show that her bones are stronger, in fact, than metal, when, in fact, we know that they're not. So well, she, in that universe, they are. In exactly. Fact, so how does she get there? She gets there Europe under Europe. fear and stress and, and under love. Love drives okay. her to I that don't universe. Know. I'm studying that now. Um, in my book, I will talk about taking control. Yeah, because myself, as a Hindu, as a Hindu, my my, you know, in the science of Hinduism, which is considered a science, you know, we we like the the idea that you can get there. So we would focus on how do you get there. Everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody. Well, every single. It's like body music. To yeah. control your heart rate, pulse, and respiration, that's what I did with Navy SEALs back in the early 70s. Right. I used Were you working together with the Monroe Institute at that moment, at that time, or was that in, different? That was something Monroe else. Monroe Institute. Monroe Institute didn't exist. Monroe was a SEAL at Berkeley. Uh, Monroe oh, Okay. Institute, that was the 80s? Had, oh, yeah. No, he was, he was still doing his journeys. Okay, um, that was in 80s. Okay. I'm a little too right, early. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, now this is at the time we're just now starting to talk about brain entrainment and the uses of that technology to do mm -hmm. as tools. And that's where I taught SEALs. I set up Manager Foundation just to study Jack Schwartz and, uh, oh, who was that? Keith Milton Reinhardt. There was I. Uh, he was a Quarian Foundation out of, out of Seattle and he could pull gems out of his mouth. Right. Well, there's still people in India that can do that, you know. Well, at what <laughs> is happening is that in the brief moment I've been talking to you, you have gone into probably as many as 600 different universes in this right. just this brief moment. And each one of them has a different law than the other one. 
For example, in a light state of hypnosis, right, right there, right there, right here, my ability in guessing is 400 times over where I am right here. Right here, I'm statistical inference. When I go to here, now I can have 400 times more because I'm closer to purpose. Right why I chose to be here than I am here where I am working from a place of wounding. You know, when I came out of the womb. <laughs> Do you remember? The first, yeah. Yeah. The Do first you? thing they did is they hit me. They took me away to be fingerprinted before I could even. <laughs> bond and they yeah. popped my dick off. I was circumcised. <laughs> I, imagine the trauma of something like that. In terms Do of you have the memory of being born to do you? You know, and so I came from a place of wounding. I understand, but do you have the memory? Do you have that as a conscious memory? Is that you your earliest know. conscious memory? You can get, you can all get there. Just but like I mean, but I'm asking you, did you access there. that straight away? Was that something you came, because a lot of people have to work to get that, but do you have that I as a conscious memory? I have to work for it. Okay, okay. That was my okay. question. Okay, everybody has to work for it. It isn't going to be handed to you. You got to earn it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> the Piper Man, you know, right from your eye, you know. uh, yeah, that guy, and right. so uh, Sharon. So okay, Sharon Singh. Okay. Well, I'm just messing with you, you know, because yeah. my teacher was Sharon Singh. That's why. That's what I just said. Yeah. Okay. okay so I yeah. I have a set of roles that I hold myself true to. Yeah. This is what distinguishes ethics over morals. Right. I'm a moral man. You know, an ethical man knows not to cheat on his wife. A moral man won't. And then when you walk your talk, it becomes yeah. evident that you're working from a place of purpose more than wounding and intent. Right. I agree That's with you. That's what you're trying to do is step outside a universe that an AI can't follow. And That's that another thing we want to talk about, but there's too many things to unpack. So I'm going to let you pick, you know, one oh, thing. Say, <laughs> no, no, not that way. But I will say this. There's, there's several things. One is, one is the, the goal of a lot of the spirituality with, without the understanding of science. And this is always a little bit the problem is that, in, and, and in some ways the yogis got it already. And then they need someone to decipher what it is they're already accessing. They need someone to be able to write it down, and it looks well, like a lot of mathematical we stuff. About that earlier, you yes. know, the idea of having a, a reference point. Exactly, but for the but for the person, the un the uninitiated. Let's speak about that. The person that's uninitiated, they're looking at it and they're just saying, "How do I do this? How do I, how do I understand what's happening to me when one day I'm walking down the street and there's a house that I've seen every day." And the very next day, I'm walking down the, the street, and the house is completely different. And when I talked to the owners of the house, and I asked them when they changed their house, they told me that they changed it uh, three months earlier than I had seen it. But yet, I know that I, was, I saw it the day before. So that's, there's one thing. Adala. Yeah, that's well, a mandala thing. And then you have the people who say, okay, how is it that I can get into such a state of mind that when, when my loved one is trapped in a car and I have to rip the door off, I'm able to do it. And then the other thing. Th and you make sure it doesn't happen. And that's that by going yeah. in. Okay. What chose the balance in neurotransmitters working with dimethyltryptamine? <laughs> you know, that chill that goes up or down. Yeah. The spine? Right. That's dimethyltryptamine. Right. The one that goes, oh, that's lysergic acid amide. There are eight basic neurologic circuits I work with. What I'm trying to do 45 years later is learn how to orchestrate them in my mind's eye like you can the chill at will. So I'm doing a conscious volitional direction on where I want to go and why. I have intent within my purpose. Okay. And with Okay. That is when you become inflamed. On fire, you said. Yeah, you're on fire. <laughs> yeah, man on fire. You're inflamed. You're caught up in the moment of the poetry. Right, right. Okay, okay. It's poetry. 
And once you center in on that place, the way Aleister Crowley put it, none shall say nay. You're in perfect harmony with the universe on all levels. And what you've done is what Jim Morrison used to sing about. Break on Trust through the other side. The other side. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, there is more going on. This is, by the way, I'm gonna do something weird. Okay. I hope you see that. That is Grandfather Joseph. Is that, that he, is is he in his coffin? Is he, is he, is he, is he passed? We'll show it again. Oh, okay. That is Grandfather Joseph. The medicine man that died in the crossroads when Jim Morrison was 10 years old. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I know. But that's one of the things the military had me do was vet out this individual that was a non-dead Jim Morrison working for a laser company in, uh, in um, uh, Louisiana years after he was peeing on stage on people. Now, let me say this. I, I didn't like Jim Morrison. <laughs> he was, you will find that in a very rare book by Feral Press called Secret and Suppressed. And that article was written by Tom Lytle, one of my personal friends, that did uh, ethnog uh, let's see, um, uh, uh, psychedelic monographs and essays. He was out of he was out of uh, uh, Florida, uh, mostly Miami and that area up north, um, and all the fetish bars <laughs> and stuff. Uh, and I uh, got to get, be, Tom was my friend. He's the one that did uh, that interview in High Times on me called Growing Pot on the Moon when I worked for Boeing, Lunar Base Alpha One before it was called the Space Center. And it was called South Park. It was the Boeing Scientific Research Laboratories. That's where they put gifted men. And I was working, my dad was down the hall working in plasma physics, and I was working under Art Pilgrim with a model of, of uh, a platform hydroponic system that was based on New Galilee Gardens at that time. And we had converted it over, and I had a number of crops I was working on I was a physicist in charge of light in terms of how they would respond. Like uh, marijuana, I was working with cannabis indica uh, because I was working at very high altitudes. I was in space and I wanted to see what would happen when these things got exposed to CBDs and uh, <laughs> not CBDs and marijuana, but long ultraviolet, CBCs, okay. CBAs. The longer CBD is life. what is in uh, marijuana, but that's the cannabinoidal system. But anyway. Yeah, changing the drop in the cannabinols yeah. uh, because it was a Gaussian distribution and what you wanted was to modify them over into the more psychoactive rather than the soporifics. And if you could skew the curb by using light uh, in the tumble, that was at that time we had only 60 cannabinols. Mm. And why, when I go to Amsterdam, I always <laughs> have uh, a room uh, set for drug, uh, what do they call that? Um, World Authorities and Drugs. There's a place in Amsterdam. My friend runs the Marijuana Museum. And, okay. uh, yeah, and uh, Joseph. And he took me to a very cool place uh, once it called, uh, it was a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting there smoking our hashish when, in private room when in okay. walks a belly dancer. Oh. But she's not belly dancing. She's doing folk dancing. Previous. Okay. It was, we both, you have, I have a picture and we're going, <laughs> oh, like, what? Amsterdam, you gotta love it. Um, that's a long time ago at one of the Nexus conferences. And uh, Joseph runs the uh, Marijuana Museum and you go up some stairs and it's all very cool. Um, Are you able I, to tell us anything about being in space or not? Or is that classified? <laughs> well, I know we're jumping around, but you say things, and I and I want to I want to hear more about those. What would you like? To I go said, first? well, I know I just uh, because everyone here is interested in space, space travel, that kind of thing. You, you mentioned can. at the very you can right now because mind's body is so um, susceptible to long gamma rays and long ultraviolet and other things that even our experiments of trying to send rats. Uh, and uh, other environments to Mars shows them up showing up dead. It takes several weeks to get there, and in that time you're dead. To go around the moon 
when I was at Mission Control working with Ed Mitchell, um, basically, Ed's never going to have children again. Hmm. The gamma rays are so intense as yeah. to truly affect the astronauts. What we're going to need, what Elon Musk and others are working toward, will be avatars, something that we can place our consciousness in like a robot, uh, our physical body. <laughs> uh, what we are is down here on a big protected shell called the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And it screens out all that harmful shit that's out there. And now with smart meters and uh, 5G towers, they want to bring it right down to the local level and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's an end game weapon, by the way. And I'd be happy to talk about how that works as a weapon. Uh, that's one of the end game weapons. They have just things like smart bullets that are little drones the, you know, the fly on the wall that's photographing, photographing everything. When they put a shaped charge in that, enough to take out a single brain. Right. Then they put an AI to direct that, and there's no defense. And if you deployed 10,000 of them over an aircraft going over a little small town with each buddy's name on it, that's pretty much it. Because they can do DNA sampling now from your trash and other things and be able to have a record of your fingerprint, your DNA fingerprint which means they can selectively target one individual over another in a given room as a weapon. So right. the technologies today are getting very creepy. What we're really discovering is that it isn't the government that's bad. Um, it's factions within right. that are above the law right. and uh, have uh, you know, plausible deniability, and their get out of jail cards. Well, what is their what is their end game? What do they want? What do they really want? These people. Well, I mean, seriously, they have all the power anyway. Why do they need to target anybody for anything? Yeah. They have yeah. everything at their disposal. What do they want? I don't know. Uh, I will you know say what I mean? I mean, what do they need more? What more do they need? Merlin put it very accurately to Arthur in a book by T.H. White, when he turned to Arthur and he said, anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory. That mean, there's your multiverse. That means that anything you could possibly imagine is why are they doing it? Right. It's true. Right, it's all the, and it's more. the experience and, thing. And, and more. Right. There's your multiverse, right. working with imagination. Right. And the fact that this, is not real. Right. And if you can get your head wrapped around that concept briefly, now you have the possibilities of what is would call the next stage in the evolution of consciousness or awareness. It's it's a it's a massive step, I might add. Well, it's like the freeing in, step. It's the thing that frees us because then we aren't playing in the same. We free ourselves from this this uh, victimhood that we seem to be stuck in a little bit. We can just get out of this. Uh, How this, do you this get control. out of the movie or change the movie? I stay tuned on that. Same bad channel, same bad time. Well, I think Will that. Robin, Batman. The, Will the, Batman. It, it's it comes in. It comes through realization of like you said that this isn't real and 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 well that or no that's what the that's what the egyptians called it the realization mm -hmm. of that or new no. now the ability to step outside and go to the next level or go to the other side right that's essentially what jim morrison was singing and basically that shaman that died was not human, uh, it's not, that's not true. It is another life form on earth that can do things we will, by divine right, be able to do, we're simply not aware of it. What makes the distinction between a Dalai Lama and you is the fact that he has access to his genetic memory. Right. And you have uh, Reese's negative genome <laughs> that is uh, essentially blocking that, except using very specific tools like hypnosis, drugs, 
rock and roll and sex. The, the, um, or when I'm in a trance. The, uh, the, I was just reading, there was a physics, uh, the physicists are now saying that they, that they do accept that trauma impacts your DNA and that you bring DNA memory oh, with you. Accept that, do they? Oh, well, Which funny. I don't think it only is, I don't think it's only uh, limited to trauma, but that's of course where they go. But you know, I, I, have, I have very, very visceral uh, things. The first time I went to New York City, you know, I felt at home there. I felt so at home there. And you know, when I finally did found out, no, no, no. But, but when I found, when I found my uh, family tree, you know, I ended up living just around the corner from where my great grandfather lived and where my uncle, we walked the same streets. And when I got there, I felt it. I knew it. I had the same when I went different places. There's, we bring a lot with us that we don't really realize that we maybe don't pay attention to, but it's, it's embedded within us. I, there's a question I have because you 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 mentioned this uh, the shaman that died at the crossroads, which is very funny because I just sent a kid. I'm the chairwoman of the Dutch Blues Foundation here, and I just sent a young boy to uh, Mississippi, and I said to him, "Stay out of the crossroads, <laughs> whatever you do, stay out." Um, but why did Jim Morrison go so dark? Why did he go so dark? He was hanging out with uh, Lee Ginsburg. You know, and they just went so dark. I remember, because when I lived in New York, I, I really got into reading Ginsburg and, you know, I'd sit in the cafe where Ginsburg would sit and stuff like that. I, why did they go so dark? So brilliant. So, so in tune. But why did they go so yes, dark? Uh, into the out of. If you have one, you must, by definition, have the other. Mm. It's all inclusive. Sure, sure. What polarizes the light in from the darkness is man's consciousness. Yeah. It is neither. God's not the devil. The devil is not fighting God. I don't need a priest to pray to God on my behalf. No. Well, then there it is. Man's interpretation on a limited scale trying to enforce it on other men. And every child, each one of us is uniquely different, probably yeah. a different religion than any other. Yeah. Actually, as a religion being mm. fellowship and rules of engagement. You know, what you picked up from your parents, what you pick up from people like me, and what you pick up from life. Why you become what you are. And remember, it was Batman in the Batman movie. It is not <laughs> what you are, yeah. but what you do. Right, right defines who you are right there it is it's always important to remember the important parts of the glass being half full not half empty well were uh, you at uh, yale or you were at you were at harvard were you at harvard when uh uh albert john, uh, mack. john mack took my third course uh, meta three and then started alien abductions as dean of psychiatry and it was may as his teacher that reminded him that he could not do this to prove the existence of God, but what he could do is treat the trauma. Right. And that was because God is by definition, here we go back into its own truth. He's ambivalent by definition. Yeah, God is that which, which remains. cannot be known. It can <laughs> That's only, true. only be experienced. Hold one it's second. Moment. So if you want to experience God, have to go to the moment and most of us do you know this book uh, which one Wait, one second let me put my head so quickly. oh i got her excited <laughs> do you know this book do you know this book i am that yeah well who that did say who that when i say who that well, it's just it basically just you just basically quoted this maharaji Maharishi Mahishoga. Yeah, he, I did a business plan for him in Texas when his uh, yellow turban to uh, Umbayas, <laughs> granola. Uh, let's see what else. Um, this is the contamination. I'd went through Bennett School of Gurdjieff. I had to make my own tools before I could eat. And uh, I, I did that as a discipline because if you will watch a video, very mm -hmm. cool video, called movie 
called Meetings with Remarkable Men uh, about Gurdjieff Benespensky. Right. And then do comma dance scene. And the largest one, you will see the different levels of women that are doing Tai Chi, trying to do. What they're doing is learning how to move the body for the final movement of cadence. 17 men do a rodent coil and create energy out of movement like uh, Gabriel Roth might do in dance or Kate Bush. Now, when you see that concept, right. like whirling dervish, where they're able to take a sword and go right through the stomach, continue dancing around, and there's no blood. How do you do that? I think it's the same That's way as you I change the dimensions that. again. Yeah. I'm going to say that, that magic is the new direction in physics, like alchemy led to chemistry. So now physics will study magic as uh, the art of changing consciousness at will. The okay. Jesuits did it by whipping themselves. Right. Um, you can do drugs, <laughs> you can do sex, you can do rock and roll. Or you um, can meditate. Yes, training the mind <laughs> be very Just, disciplined. It doesn't have to all be pain and uh, disconnection. Can, uh, David has a question for you, if, sure. if that's okay. Of course. Hello, how are you, Richard? Going bald, unnatural causes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I pulled it uh, my, my question to you was, uh, and with all your work in, as in uh, quantum physics field and all that, have you come up with an explanation of what magic is? Yes, it's an art form, and it's different for each of us. It, it's an art form, like sculpting or painting. It's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not an end game. It's a right. process of, of altering consciousness at will and using it as a tool in a toolbox. Right. Okay. Altered states of consciousness, and there's a whole ontology of these mystical states where this one begins and this one ends, and then this one begins. And okay, when you start to map that out, like you do music using biofeedback, I did three books for the military that are unpublished on video feedback systems called The Diamond Body, Electromagic, Yogatronics. And those books were written in the 80s on how to alter neurotransmitters using light, sound, and other sensory motor inputs directed by using this brain here, not my primary brain, which is my gut. The gut is outside space time. That's why we call it ESP and intuition instinct. It is a relationship to future timelines and how the two are simply connected in an hourglass uh, going from the past into the future with just the moment. What you're trying to do is take that from the profane into the sacred. Okay. When you learn how to do that, that is the next stage in the evolution of consciousness in man. And with that comes the ability to change the movie. Okay, this is where you and I are, are always, we always get into these conversations, you and I, but because a lot of people ask about magic and they think they can buy a book and chant an incantation, it's not just that. It's, it, magic is a discipline, it is a ritual, it requires reverence, it requires understanding of the symbology of what you're doing it requires you know there's eastern mysticism which is yoga there's the western mysticism which is magic they are one and the same and they do connect but can you please talk about the importance of training when it comes to magic the importance of the study when it comes to magic and where to start maybe for people because they I, I, people talk about magic like it's something that's going to bestow itself upon you, but it, it comes from uh, it comes from a lot of in, introspection 
and it comes through discipline and it comes through and it doesn't happen in five minutes. It's something that is for many people, a lifetime study, you know, it's not snapping your well, fingers it's and it's not Harry Potter. Yeah. yeah. It's like Simon says, you can go halfway to the door. And each time you can go halfway to the door and you focus on going to the door, but by definition, by definition, you can't ever reach the door by definition and protocol. What you have missed is what the whole thing was about, the journey. It wasn't about the door. No. And so that's the distinction between laser main, which is sleight of hand, where Harry is in your pocket, and sleight of mind, where you change the movie as you choose. And what you have is purpose here. And that's really why Crowley called it a fourth kind of love. Because in the Greek versions, you had Eros, Philo, and Agape. And then Crowley added Telema, or the love of will, your purpose here. And that is your highest love in why he would say, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, but love under will. In other words, I'm open and trying to help you in any way I can, unless it deters me from my own purpose. And as right. I'm doing my, that is more important than love to you. Is that, that is not, the, but the will, the true will, as he describes in uh, the book of the law, you know, yep. the ultimate will, the ultimate goal of that book is to remind you that it's only about knowing your will and it's about love. It's about well, getting- that's why he calls it true will, not free. Right, exactly. Because and that the, and the goal of magic is to know yourself. That's what it says on in the top exactly. of the- That's a form of path working. That's, that's what it, it's not about changing the weather or no. it's, it's about the introspection that you have. And so I, that's why I think people say, say magic, like they think it's gonna do something well, or produce a watch or something, but it's- it's about knowing yourself. And when you know yourself and you know your true divine nature, when you know your true, truest sense, that is the goal of magic. That is also the goal of yoga. That's the Western Eastern mysticism. It's just two different routes that are taken to get there. It's a different way for yeah. not everyone. It's not for everyone. It's right. mostly for scientists, actually. Yeah. That's, because well, that's why the alchemists were very busy the with it. states as tools. Right. In a toolbox. That means that once you can control a certain uh, altered state, not taking drugs, but doing it on your own with conscious, I'm doing it, and now I'm not. And let me give you, it gets punctuated, and where psyche is brought into matter. And that is the Masonic secret. I'm going to give you the secret of the Masonic secret. Here it is. Okay, every, no wonder we're on Zoom. Here it is. <laughs> the big one. Uh -huh. okay. The thought that occurs at the moment of climax happens. Yeah. Well, why? Because that is the when you are actually you touching the essence of yourself. Yeah. With your neurotransmitter, you right. went wang. Yeah. And if you can develop that into the highest forms of Tantra, where you're not doing it because like if you're thinking of another guy while you're having an orgasm, what's gonna happen? You're gonna be that anchored to that guy. <laughs> you're gonna be really anchored to the guy. So that's, what about, that's what chaos magic, that's what chaos magic plays with a lot. Is is uh, do you know who Grant Morrison is? Do you know who he is? Yeah. He he you know what he does before he writes his uh, a new comic or whatever? He does his sigil and then he does Tantra, but instead of doing like uh, sex magic, he will jump from a plane. And at that moment of complete shrill terror, that's when he anchors that sigil. So he does it a little, di <laughs> a little differently. In yeah. yoga, in it's yoga. Chaos magic. <laughs> and, uh, you know. Yeah, but in, but in Tantra, <laughs> but in the yoga tradition of Tantra, it's not necessarily uh, uh, sexualized. It can no. also be through the height of the connection that you experience when you're in the deepest form of meditation, through sound, through toning, through Vedic chanting, when you just, whatever it takes you get that through that door, when you talk about the door, however well, you go in. Different. Yours, yeah. 
Yeah. And your yeah. vision, like how you would control your heart rate. Yeah. How do you know that? Do, 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 do. You know, I had a medical doctor that was going to, I went into his office and he cuffed me. You know how they cuff you right away. And uh, I was 151 over 84 or something like that. And he immediately, oh, this is very bad. Your uh, AMA says you're supposed to be at 130. And if I can't put you on meds, uh, you know, then I'm going to have to fire you. And I said, um, cuff me again. <laughs> I put it 129, eat me. And uh, by the way, that's an English thing from the longbow, uh, going through front, uh, French armor. <laughs> that's where that came from. Now listen, the whole thing is set up and one size doesn't fit all and why medicine is broken and why you need to take charge of your own personal life because nobody else is going to do it right for you. That's it. And that's it. And so it's sovereign, uh, maritime law, captain and commander. I'm in charge of myself. Do what thou wilt. I, um, I'm not a Crowleyite, by the way, because a teacher can only take you as far as they themselves have gone. Right. Crowley, well, Crowley died as a drug addict in Haiti. You know, it reminds me of tombstone and opiates. And now we've got CBDs. Uh, Good old boy chemistry. Uh, well, um, when Jim Morrison died, <laughs> he didn't actually die. He was 10 years old. What happened was that that shaman placed his consciousness into Jim Morrison's body as a walk-in, or what do you call a ride-along. These are life forms that the military had me check out in the 70s. I go on location to find out how they did that, you know, what's going on, what's really going on. Isolating the variables was the big problem, and the real sense of it is we never really knew, just like right now, because it doesn't work like that. There are some things that are not knowable at any century. So when did Jim uh, Morrison actually leave his body? When? Was that before he kind of, before all the crazy stuff started uh, happening with him, or is it... Be drugs. Sex, rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, Jim Morrison was kind of a, he was just a wild child. He was having fun, you know, being the sort yeah, of, of you know, rock and roll guy, you know? Yeah, like I do. You know, we're all four years old, not seven. We have right. not been messed with yet to the point where we have a more pure relationship. So, something Stanislav Grof might want to write about. Self realization, mm -hmm. having di internal dialogue. So that at any given moment, I knew, I, I, I've always known how I felt about something at any given moment. It changes. And that's because of the hologram and this undisciplined tool that we have not yet explored in terms of using it as a tool. I would like to have the strength of 10 ants being able to lift what an ant can do. I can do that. I can yeah. do that on methamphetamine. I can do that on, uh, let's say, a host of other drugs, including my own conscious will. I can't hold it for very long, but in a given moment, I can scare the bejesus out of people. <laughs> well, what the hell is that? <laughs> Dang, <laughs> what is that? Live from New York? Let me ask you a question. It is what popped into my mind, so I know that it's relevant. What is the difference between what the shaman did with Jim Morrison and what the Jews did when they created the uh, Gullums? Yes, that's the distinction of John Curtis Gowan's work on the development of the psychedelic individual at Northridge. He got awards for this work where he talks about prototoxic, paratoxic, and syntactic modes of consciousness. And prototoxic modes are shamanistic, very low level, like glossia and automatic writing. Right. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't have that sense of reference. And so a shaman can place his consciousness in the eye of a bird and see what the bird sees. Right. I've done that. Right. And I can send you a picture of Don Gennaro that Peter First and I went down and captured on film for Arts Canada in a rare edition called Stones, Bones, and Skin, where we actually show this equilibrium, what they call shamanistic equilibrium, where he can fly. Now. Right. I 
don't understand how to do that, except that I now can do that. It's like magic is advanced physics with a mystery school. It's like how you drive an automobile. You don't normally think in terms of how an internal engine combustion system is working to give you momentum. You just know that if you do a certain risk real estate program, like the key goes in here, and it's turned there, you have certain expectations of reality. Mm -hmm. That anthropologically is called magical thinking. Right. Okay, that's where our sciences are going. And that's where we're gonna go in the next 20 years to determine how these different altered states can be used as a tool in a toolbox. Now here's the bad news. So I discovered these concepts very early on and I decided I wanted $50,000. I'm speaking as a metaphor now. Okay. What happened next was a truck drove over me and I got my $50,000 <laughs> medical expenses. Da, 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 da. It's a, that, like, okay, the precision of that thought form is that you get what you want, but not exactly the way you wanted it. And it creates That's another the genie. Form. That's the genie. That's the yeah. genie curse that you get. Be careful what you wish for kind of idea. There it is. So I decided, oh, well, with that understanding, okay, thank you, Lord. I am now only going to want things that it doesn't matter what it costs me to know. And that was spirituality. I wanted to become more spiritual, and it didn't matter what it's going to cost me. And right now, I'm currently penniless, so it's got a physical component to it. Yeah. I, 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 it's, trust me, it's all part of the big plan. <laughs> How did John Lennon put it? Oh, yes. Everything works out in the end. If things aren't working out, it's not yet the end. That's true. As long as you're here, you're supposed to be here. Yeah, well, you want to use this as a tool rigorously. And so learning how to meditate gives me bliss. Right. But bliss and bliss states, jhana states, higher states of consciousness, Persinger and others which study, it's just a certain kind of thing on the top of my cerebral cortex that is not in the reticular activating center. It's not over on the Wernicke correction with the Mars project. It's not up to do to do. Did you know they even have a new game of gamers, uh, yeah. right? Playing with the Wernicke correction and the Mars project. So what's happening now is that we are creating a set of mandalas. <laughs> And uh, the mandala is a uh, geometry. It's not a man. So there, gotcha. Uh, we're creating a series of mandalas. <laughs> yeah, that will lead to the mandala effect. <laughs> it's a closed system and unique for each of us. Explain the, clo what the concept of clone system so people know what you mean. Explain what a closed system is so that they understand. That there's nothing going on but you. And yes, this song is about you. <laughs> Thank Early you. Timing. Thank yeah. you. I'm so vain. I'm glad this song is about me. You're, you're getting through that, and I love the red hair. And remember <laughs> this always. Yeah. Attitude is all there is. Yeah. And if you've got the right attitude, man, you're good to go. <laughs> and that's how it works. Yeah. And if you this is a Disagree, okay, we can agree to disagree, but I'm gonna play in my sandbox because this one's fertile and I'm growing things that I can't. <laughs> what the hell is that brain tumor? Oh my gosh. Uh, uh, but I'm able to now do things and have insights on things that are make me feel blessed. For example, wounds that I might have. You know, I have, this arm is shorter than okay. this arm because I have no elbow. That okay. me, I, I saved the arm. <laughs> you know. Did you leave it in space, yeah. your elbow? Yeah, yeah. well, it's, you can't tell because I never let anybody sweat. I can't pick my nose very good. 
but uh, like I can go, you know. Up, up Use your other hands. <laughs> well, no, I learned just how don't to do, do it for. We we, we believe you. What's that? I said we believe you. We don't need well, to demonstrate this. It's a metaphor. Yeah. This yeah. body is not who I am. Right. Right. What who I am. Is what I'm doing with right with you right but now. But you know what? I just was. Can I tell you something? I was just reading because I was reading this book. I am that. Uh, it's by Sri. It's it's Sri Nisa Gadatta Maharaji, and he said, "Yes, you are not your body, but in fact, you are. You are all of your. You are not only your body. You're everything else. You are not not your body as well as being your body. Your body is real in this. Well, physical plane, yeah. emotional plane is more detailed. In other words, instead of and indeterminacy and uh, decoherence in quantum mechanics, what right. you have is resolute, you have information and resolution of information. Right. Now, that Instead of looking at space time, what you're doing is looking at information. And information, there is a theorem in information theory that states, if you have enough information to ask a coherent question, you have enough information to answer it. It's true. Now, now that means there's the physical plane, and above that, that's IQ. And then there's AQ. How you feel about the physical plane? It is, it is the what we call resolution of information. It's more detail on the information. And at some level, I'll call it the archetypal level or archetypal plane. That's where you are made and I am you, and I am the walrus, which means if I'm here, you're gonna be here shortly. Yeah. In other words, everybody is waking up. And everybody understood exactly what I'm saying in their own ideas of it. And that is the truth of it. Right. I am nothing more than a lead scout, that's why the military used me. I was always ahead of the curve. And I, I'm a lead scout. That's all. I'm just an extra little, uh, you know, whatever I am. Uh, and but I am spiritual because that's what I use my path working for is to become a more spiritual man. That means I'm moral, very moral. Try to walk my talk so that my child, my grandchildren, see how I did it. That's how they learn how to be pedophiles and uh, thieves and drug addicts right. they watch their parents and uh so you teach your children well because in my universe our children are possibly the most important natural resource we have david has a question for you thank you for that okay. hello hello I feel that we have a spiritual connection and I feel that you may have been Merlin in a past life or an aspect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did they said to Arthur, oh, I didn't see this. <laughs> so I was Lancelot in a past life, actually. So That's a great movie, you know. <laughs> actually, um, my question to you uh, was, what is the benefit of knowing about past lives in this life? I don't put much importance on it in my <clears throat> life because this is the end game for me. Right now, this moment. Mm. And all of my past lives are at this moment in dialogue with my future timeline. And what does that mean? When I say something to you, and you, of all the different things that I've said, that's important, this, this one, right, right, right here, right here. That, that, that's the one I wanna know about. That is how your future timeline is talking to your moment right now. Hmm. If you can integrate that into the moment where you're taking this wonder of this moment focusing on it, what it does is it changes your past. Hmm. When I say that, the example I would give you is that when I was doing uh, Navy SEALs, we were called SEAL Corp out of Amherst. Navy had not yet started 
filling it up with divers. Field Team 1 was not Navy SEALs. Yes, we were. We became SEALs, but Navy Intelligence. I'm a GS-18. I didn't belong in the Navy. I was a hired gun. I was a kid that worked for the Navy. I didn't want to be an officer. I didn't want to rule anybody. I'm a nerd. I wanted to work in a laboratory. Give me my toys and watch me fly. Now, what they did is they liked me so much, they did all the paranormal stuff. That means when nobody else could figure it out, then they bring us in. And what we did, we caught a lot of flies. <laughs> I have no idea what it all means. But I've seen things to know there's something else going on here than our physics. And I'm enough of a physicist, enough spirit, that I sense some of it doesn't work like that. It's a closed system. That's why you have two brains, science and religion. But they're the same. And they're actually connected by the new adult, the bottleneck, just like an hourglass. <laughs> it's just like an hourglass. And uh, it's a closed system. And what you're doing, you're making it larger, worldviews, and the ability to access those worlds. That's the next evolution of man's consciousness. And that's what I'm aspiring toward. And if I can do it, you will be doing it shortly. That's a fact. So you want to integrate, um, like when something resonates with you, you want to integrate that into your life, you're saying? In, at that moment, right then, right there, yes. That is, that's how the timeline that you're trying to follow and the purpose over intent of why you came here. Okay, thank you. You bet. Good luck. Keep a diary. That's how you dialogue with yourself because your diary changes and it's a snapshot of that moment and now you're here and you go back and read that moment and it's like a hologram. It'll put you right back in that moment which is different from here. Now a language starts going on where you're able to dialogue with yourself and at least have self-realization. God realization is probably going to require a helicopter with a pilot. <laughs> I, I don't know. I uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Christine you. has a question for you. Thanks, David. Yes, sir. Christine. The girl. Hello, hello. Oh, hi. Um, you probably don't remember me from the last time we all talked, but um, I was wondering. Um, Will the advancements on, let's say, the African continent, which I'm sure there's a whole mess more that um, needs to be revealed, will that advance us quicker? Is that why there's so much uh, destruction or um, obstruction or distractions going on in Africa to keep people from... From the blood diamonds and the rest of uh, <laughs> DiCaprio? Yeah, well, um, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that Kilauea, the name that keeps coming up on Kilauea is Rothschild, trying to be the last man standing because he knows the gold standard and money are going to hit a brick wall. If he takes out everything first, he'll still be ahead. The Rothschild that well, just... Well, I'm speaking in metaphor, um, oh. fracking, and uh, what has actually caused Kilauea to happen right now, and right. What, the fact that the Earth is literally expanding. The Earth doesn't circle the sun. This is Cliff High, others. Um, it actually is like a comet. The sun is round going through space and it's dragging along this debris. And while it's doing that Earth, so the Earth is actually in a helical spiral around, you know, trying to catch up with the sun. Oh. And uh, that's a correct way of doing it. Meanwhile, the sun is rotating its own little ball, etc. So we have burps and gaps. The sun today and today's models are best seen as an electric system rather than a nuclear one. Uh, you have options. Um, actually, I just posted on docram.com, that's my Facebook page, um, about how they have used this hydrogen reactor to create particles like I did in high school. <laughs> uh, 60 times hotter than the sun. I did that as my undergraduate thesis in 1965. 
by building the first plasma jet. I did that as a thesis topic as an undergraduate. That's why old man DuPont was there to hire me when I came out of undergraduate school. He took me back east, and the rest is history in terms of where I am today. I, um, it's all changed. Old man DuPont no longer reports to, uh, you know, uh, the other guy. <laughs> it's all different now with Bilderbergers and who cares. When I came out of grad school, I had to armor up with all the assaults on Rush, like a high school kid going to college. And my clubs that were coming at May were real weird. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Skull and Bones, uh, uh, Bohemian Grove, uh, I had to armor up. And that's why I studied six years with Gershom Cholom. I learned Old Hebrew and Greek. I speak Old Hebrew. And by the way, that was the erection of the trapezoid. And uh, that's what I did in terms of defending myself to what's going on with Christianity. I went, became a Missouri Synod Lutheran catechism so I could armor up. And uh, I have run my own ship. I have my own beliefs of assumed truths and uh, definitions. And what I choose are comfortable, like Christianity. Belief systems are tools. And uh, there are certain tools, like this sweater I have, I will never throw it away. <laughs> Christianity, well, I won't do it. It says a nice sweater. It may rot on the vine because it's so old now. <laughs> but I like that sweater. I really made me feel comfortable. And Christianity, belief systems like that, are, are tools that sometimes are not appropriate. Like if you were a Christian and two aliens walked in the door, could you see them? You know, that's a metaphor. And you have to understand that a belief gives you uh, universes that are accessible. I am the way and the light and the blah, blah, blah. And it also closes other doors like Buddhism. Now, I grew up in the street. See, that's incredible right there. What you just said, say it again. That certain beliefs give you certain doors and they close yeah, other they doors. Yeah, close other doors. Yeah, like yeah. Christianity. That's yeah. why when we say, well, but I mean, that's so important now with where we are in the world. And we say people, they just can't get it. They can't understand. It's not accessible so to mean, them with their current wrong, belief system. <laughs> yeah, that's profound yeah. right there. I just wanted to grab that out for everyone. So, okay, <laughs> go for it. I see you. Isn't that the way, Allie? I see you. <laughs> oh, I see you. No, oh, that was in Avatar. Sorry. But Allie, the, well, that, that was the greeting. I see uh, you. That was the greeting they had for each other. Yes, I see you. That is, but the, that is I, so, uh, but that's, but if you understand that, like, uh, what, what David said when we were typing, when we were, when you were first talking, he said, no wonder Christians can't, or religion can't get on board with science. They just can't grasp it. Well, and a lot can. of the time, some can, but a yeah. lot of them can't because of the beliefs, the limiting beliefs that they have, or the closed-minded beliefs that open a different world to them, but but keep them from going into a different world as well. Yeah, well, yeah and what you want to do, or at least what I want, is more access. To the yeah, world. yeah. And so you aspire toward worldviews that are more encompassing. Like a Christian cannot be a Buddhist, but a Buddhist can be a Christian. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And so it's worldviews. And it doesn't mean they're more superior no. because the broader they are, right. they also have creepier things that come along with them. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to, because we only have about 15 minutes left, and I would like to touch on it because I know that there's a lot of questions about is AI. Artificial intelligence, third wave generation, uh, third D waves. Um, you know, the Mossad uh, last year arrested 400 Palestinians on future crimes. No, I didn't know. Uh... Yeah, that was in the news. <laughs> there it is, just like in the movies. Um, yeah. And that is where it all starts. Star Trek with a replicator that we will later call a 3D printer. It starts with imagination. And artificial intelligence is a different kind of awareness, just like Michael Rizia. The kind that you and I are beginning to become more familiar with is the hierarchy of resonance in your gut. 
going from bacteria up into H. pylori and uh, hydras and all kinds of varmints. And the soil, we talk about mycorrhizae, which is the mycelium connection between the root plant and the plant itself, which is above the ground. Think of the ground surface as the moment between the underworld and the outer world, the plant and the root system. And the gut for the soil, Gaia, is a resonant cavity oscillation moving up in information, physical plane, emotional plane, intellectual plane, would be the distinction between the purpose of a chair and the purpose of a couch in basic form that Plato might have formed. And the fourth level is where the walrus comes in, and then you have four more levels of awareness. And that's the part that I'm going toward now. And learning how to do that using the release of neurotransmitters in my brain, working in conscience with each other to develop a certain specific state in altered states that I care to go to change this moment. Okay, when we talked earlier too, you were. <laughs> <laughs> that will mean something to every single one of you, slightly. Differently. <laughs> I, I, I followed it in my own way. <laughs> I'm playing with you. I I'm know. working with neurolinguistics, pig lipping, yeah. and all the rest of the tools that come along in the arsenal of using consciousness as a tool to do something more than, it's a new car! <laughs> How very NLP of you. So, <laughs> You're getting it, aren't you? Yeah, I got it, yeah. I can't, but I can't articulate it. Well, I will tell you, when I talk to you about channeling, when I talk to you about channeling, and, and sure. my, my higher knowing uses very similarly a analysis of a, an analogy of a tree, as the tree above the ground is you. It's what springs forth. The, the, the ground is the veil between the worlds, and the root system is your soul, but it's actually still one tree. And the root system is, in fact, the most important part of the tree that is actually plugged in to the all that is, which is the earth. So there is a woman. We don't, they don't use the word oscillating system, but I think I they might, yeah, yeah, they might pull, pick it up. There is a, yeah, <laughs> there's a, there's a, uh, a woman up in U University of British Columbia, okay. uh, the University of British Columbia, uh, in forestry, that talks about the mother tree that will set a language to tell the rest of the smaller tree, her children, grandchildren, whatever, that there's an incoming forest fire. Yeah. Or a storm. Yeah. Now, life as we understand it and consciousness and what we understand that and what constitutes an alien is going to take on a whole new perspective. Yeah. It won't be from Alpha Centauri with reticulums and uh, long tongues like. Uh, what was it? Oh, yeah, L. Ron Hubbard, where she puts her ear, tongue in this ear and it comes out the other ear and he goes, oh. That just shows you how much he had in between his ears. Well, L. Ron Hubbard in Scientology came out of the use of science melding with, with, with magic. And I'm hopefully going to try to show a different way. And rather than be a leader with Orient, the Temple of the Orient, GM Argenum and all these other lodges. I am a light or a camel. <laughs> Gimmel. Gimmel. The camel. I'm a uh, tracks in the desert. And there were five tracks. That's Gimmel. Five. For light, life, liberty, law. Light, life, love, liberty, and law. There are five elements there that are important. The gimel is this, right? What's how does that? the gimel look? The gimel is the Hebrew letter. What is it? How does it look? It's, uh, it's a jump yet, just like you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't read it <laughs> as much as I now speak it. I okay. used to speak it. If I look, I'll immediately know. 
I don't go there because I'm right now working in the other side of my brain. Can I tell you something? Remember I said I was writing a book? Yes, you did. Do you and know I who, and stuff. I told you I was talking to someone. Do you know who I'm talking to? The mother tree in my book. Who are you talking to? The mother tree. That's who I'm talking to. Yeah. That's, uh, you're talking to Gaia. Yeah. Gaia is feminine. Mm. She is real. Yes. And she's aware. And yeah. just like God is, there's, there's more going on here than we have any clue yeah. to. Yeah. And I, the more as I study it as a scientist, so I have a traceable reference point, physical plane, because if it's true there, true. Yeah, micro, macro, as above, so below. Right? Well, that's one metaphor, Hermes. Uh, Merlin, Merlin was a pick, a uh, real smart one, I might add. Uh, so was, uh, never mind. I, I, there's throw of history. We have identification in our literature, like Socrates and Plato mm -hmm. and Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a mathematician, the likes of which the world will never probably ever. Uh, he's uh, unbelievable. Bob Marshall. I have a manuscript called the Marshall Papers that is on my translations of Bob Marshall's work working with Buckminster Fuller. Now, Bob was an idiot savant that originally created the concept of the buckyball, the C60 and the C120 molecule bonding. Um, I uh, was brought in because nobody could understand him. What he would do, he had a yellow tablet, and he'd draw things out with mathematical tables. And what we did is we took pictures of those, and then Dr. Lenny Time got a whole bunch of different mathematicians and other whiz kid type people to make comment and interpretation of each of Bob Marshall's chapters. One chapter is on the Riemann challenge from more than a hundred years ago. Riemann, the mathematician, challenged the mathematical community to come up with a mathematical expression for recurring primes. That would be in base 10. Uh, base three doesn't have primes. So what happened was the way Bob Marshall did it, is he envisioned a cone, three-dimensional cone, that had a line going down in a spiral in the opposite direction that you could draw a straight line through for recurring primes. That's how Bob Marshall did it, visually. Now, that level of mathematics, to be able to see in your mind's eye, is a quality that we all aspire toward in the clarity of vision. And the way you take that thought and place it into matter, psyche into matter, that's why you're here. Learn how to do that. And once you do that, you now become a Buddhist, uh, what we call a Dalai Lama. I, that's the hat I wore in a previous life. That's the bird that I use to communicate. That's the, you know, that place, you can do that right now with hypnosis. You can go into past and future lives. What's that work and how's that work? Well, there is where chi, the surface energy, is outside the body, physical body, down below the groin, and you bring it up, and you release it. That chi is structured water in microtubules. And that original work I did with uh, Dr. Um, he was uh, Dean of, of, uh, of Anesthesiology, Bonica, John Bonica. I was working under Ray Fink. That's where Rick Chapman and Dr. Black and several of Burgess, others, came up with the concept of microtubule 20 years before Hameroff was born. <laughs> yeah. And microtubules are proteins that erupt, that if you place a single drop of water in there, they're like a buckyball, they change the structure of it, and it becomes an exclusion zone water that is a place for holding memory, that's why they call it memory in water. And uh, it is like the forbidden zone or with gallium and arsenic for gallium arsenide, 
you have this forbidden zone, which is where all your information is stored, right there between the, the, the two chips, between the one and the other, it's at that very point right in there where the information is stored. That's called the forbidden zone. And in water, it's called the exclusion zone. And that exclusion zone is one million times more efficient than a computer chip. And that's where our, your soul lies, or what they call the ba and the ka in Egyptian mythology. And Chinese medicine found it using, they called it qi. It's had many different names throughout history, including piranha, odic force, uh, ether, aether. Uh, it has uh, a different chapter I wrote in the non-local mind. It's called the Omega Principle. Mm -hmm. Energy that patterns randomness. That idea that there's something organized. Isn't it interesting that everything you eat becomes you? That's a, that's the thing. It's yeah. That's a wonderful conversation so of how outside yeah. of out, outside of you, it's not you. But as soon as you eat it, it becomes you. So how does that happen? You know, yes, it's through digestive process, organized. but that it is, becomes yeah. That's the definition yeah. we use of what is a life form. Right. Self organizing. Right. Well, that's what yeah. distinguishes something that is inanimate. Right. That's your definition. And the earth is absolutely aware yeah. and absolutely alive. Yeah. How did Frankenstein put it? It's alive! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <exactly. laughs> we're, we're really at the top of the hour, so I'm really uh, sad, but we're done. I oh I have me back. It's no problem. I we'll have you back. Everybody is starting to get the possibilities of what a bigger picture might imply. Right. And once you have that in your mind, that's all that's necessary. Yeah. To make it yours, and then each of us has our own way home. Well, everybody has their own way home. Every path is legit. You know. You and have to keep a diary. I, that's the way I did it. I kept a diary. Yeah. I have yeah. diaries back to the early 70s wow and uh every day um and dreams whatever uh, how i got delayed didn't get happened why you know those kinds of things where i'm pouring myself out to myself and then going back to those at a later right. time for renewal mm -hmm. and certain things will jump out and what happens next is you have a language that yeah. you've developed on how to talk to yourself Exactly. Once you have that language, now that language, that's a neurotransmitter. Uh, now that neurotransmitter can talk to three other neurotransmitters. And so, you know, you have that, uh, I bought it and we bought it and they bought it. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden you have access. Yeah. And that access is where it all happens. And that's why you love this moment. Yeah. Uh, how, how could you not? I mean, it's like, this is what you're aspiring toward it's a perfect moment yeah consciousness awareness mm -hmm. and doing it with, with directed purpose that's called syntactic modes of consciousness that includes biofeedback hypnosis sex magic you know there's a whole bunch of them in gowan's ontology of mystical right. the meta the in between places mythology and dream states and archetypes and that fuzzy place of parataxic modes. You have prototaxic, which is the shaman. You have trance, art, and creativity. Those are the three stages. And I am aspiring to art syntactic or art forms. And magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. Mm -hmm. Bye! <laughs> okay. Again. You learn how to do that. That yeah. is what you're supposed to be doing yeah. right now. Yeah. And what will happen is you'll fall into what in automobile is called racing. Automobile racing is called the line. You are in the flow. You're in the tracks four by four. You're not creating karma. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Karma is intent. Where you go there but you ricochet back and forth on the walls trying to find the true center of the line. Right. So we're all aspiring for lining up with our true natures so that we can 
stay in our flow. And at at will, at will. Yeah, at, at will. will, at, at will. will. Yeah. Being able to do it, it's conscious, now I'm gonna do it, and now I'm not gonna do it. That requires a switch. Mm -hmm. and that is what a ritual is, a yeah. switch, going from the profane into the sacred for that right. brief moment. Right. Dr. M, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure too, Mom. Thank you for having we me. Can, uh, we can find you on your website. Tell us your website. Yes, I'm richardallenmiller.com. A-L-A-N, miller.com. And I will go and correct every place that I misspelled your name, and I do apologize for yeah, that. Yeah, okay, no problem. I have um, about 20 minutes of changing. Plus, I have to upload the Zoom video to YouTube. Oh, well, so. that's, I can give you lots of stuff. The thing is, um, Amazon, I'm at war with Amazon right now, okay. and they're selling five different versions of a number of my titles. Who's doing that? Hmm. And I can't get them to stop. So if you want it literally, legitimately, you can get it directly from me because okay. everything that comes out of my house is autographed. That's how you tell. And right. or if you're in Europe and the freight of getting a book over to Europe is more expensive than the book itself, I'm now offering eBooks. Perfect. And I'm going to be writing so many books so fast they can't keep up with me is how I'm going <laughs> to battle this nonsense. All right. Awesome. All hail Harris. All hail Khaleesi. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste to you. Namaste yeah. to you. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you. And Thank nice you. Talking. All right. Nice talking to you too. How do I turn this off? I just go boom. I'll end the meeting and then the we'll meeting. all cut up. Yeah.